In this episode, I'm going to share an end of the year checklist with tasks that will help you prepare for your performance review, asking for a raise or promotion, or even looking for a new job in 2022. The text version of this list is available at newsletter.invinciblecareer.com called Finish This Checklist Before the End of the Year, Issue 335. This is Invincible Career, and I'm Larry Cornett. Right now, you may be dreaming about your holiday break. It's coming up fast. But you're probably still thinking about how much you need to get done in the next few weeks. I know the end of the year is busy, and it's, it's not easy to stay focused. With all the holiday preparation and all the other stuff we've put up with this year, However, spending some time on this 16-task checklist is a worthwhile career investment to make. Future you will thank you later for making the effort. In the early days of my corporate life, I thought, kind of mistakenly, (laughs) that my career growth would naturally sort itself out. All I had to do was step up, do great work, and my manager would notice it and compensate me appropriately, right? That's how it's supposed to work. However, that will only happen when you have an exceptional boss. If you're lucky enough to have a manager who is on top of things and focused on developing your career, your hard work will be rewarded. So uh, in other words, it rarely happens. I discovered that it was more common for my manager to be too busy to notice everything I'd accomplished. I'd learned that I had to take charge of my career development and advancement because the truth is no one, no one cares more about your professional growth than you do. So I had to build the case for my raises and my promotions and I had to be ready to make a significant change if things weren't going to work out for me in the company. I knew I had to be prepared before the performance review cycle began. Because if you're not, you miss the window. So you should be as well. You still have the month of December to wrap things up before the big New Year's Eve countdown. So this list that I've created will remind you of areas that might need your attention. Maybe you've already been taking care of some of them. There might be a few you haven't thought about. Plus, it's going to be a lot easier to get some of the information that's required for this, the data that you want to pull together, before everyone slips away for their vacations. If you wait until January, it might be too late. So the 16 tasks focus on priorities, goals, accomplishments, failures, projects, additional responsibilities, success metrics, requesting feedback, testimonials, team contribution, industry involvement, professional growth, your new priorities, your new goals, your personal goals and plan, and then something I call the business of you. So let's start with your priorities. What were your corporate priorities for the year? And how did those priorities trickle down to your organization, your department? More importantly, how did they translate into your priorities at work? Now, some companies have a formal process for all of this. They identify and they communicate the priorities for the year, for the quarter, and they require you to commit to your own version of those priorities at the beginning of the year. We did that at eBay. And if that sounds like your company, you're in luck. That means you've already documented them. If not, you do have a little more work to do. Maybe you created them for yourself. Maybe you didn't. You might have to dig through your emails, your other messages to try to uncover what were you supposed to be doing for the year. If your priorities changed during the year, 
This is the time to document why they changed. This is important because this can come back to bite you. You don't want your performance judged on past priorities that were made irrelevant at some point or, you know, for some reason. So I hope you have a record of why those old priorities were dropped to focus on new ones. Regardless, be clear that things did change and what your real priorities were for the rest of the year. So the second is goals. Your goals for each quarter and the year should have been directly related to the priorities. What specific outcomes did you commit to so you could support those priorities? What were your overall goals for the year? If you achieved or exceeded your goals, congrats, great, document those accomplishments. If you failed to achieve some of those goals, I'm going to talk about that a little bit later, but you'll want to document why that happened. What was under your control? What was not? And are there other goals you still want to achieve this year? You still have a few weeks to go. There's still time. So see if you could squeeze those in. The third is your accomplishments. So create a list of everything you accomplished professionally this year. You may have to go back and skim through your calendar and your message inbox to kind of jog your memory a little bit. If you do keep a projects directory organized by date, which is something I highly recommend, you can browse that as well. Obviously, your accomplishments are related to your committed priorities and goals. That's what I already mentioned, so your accomplishments should follow from that. But the one thing that we know is constant in life and business is change. This is especially true as we are more fully embracing what it means to be an agile organization. Change is a constant and trying to pretend that it's not is kind of a joke. I mean, that's just the way it is. It's the way business is. I remember creating one of my earliest self-reviews for my manager and kind of being disappointed. <laughs> you know, I, I wrote the, uh, the list of completed accomplishments and it was much shorter than I expected. Only a fraction of the commitments that I had made at the beginning of the year had survived all the way through. This is something I kind of learned. Our priorities had changed pretty much every month. I mean, it was a very turbulent time at Apple. This is the way Apple was. I, I, I wish I could remember the exact number, but I swear probably 60% of the projects I worked on got canceled and shelved. Stuff got reprioritized. So by the time I got to the end of the, end of the year, it was like, okay, what, what did I actually get done? So I, I learned that I had to take ownership of the situation and clearly explain how things had changed and how I had to pivot. And then I created a list of all of the other accomplishments that resulted from my change in focus. So don't be shy about what you claim as an accomplishment. It doesn't always have to be a formal project that was tied to some corporate priority or goal. It could be other projects that you worked on, other personal achievements that demonstrate your creativity, your productivity, your growth, and and things like that. Fourth one's pretty important, it's failures. So own your failures before they own you. This is your opportunity to control the narrative. I learned this lesson also pretty early in my career, and it has served me well for the rest of my career. Own your story and tell your story the way you want it to be told before someone else does. If it is genuinely your fault, that you fail to accomplish a committed goal, step up and own it. Don't deflect responsibility. Don't blame others. It just makes you look weak. If you're a leader, you know, you're a manager, it's even more important. It's going to happen. Your team is going to fail to deliver on a commitment. Your team's going to miss targets. And there will be myriad reasons this happens. But as the leader of the team, you own that responsibility. You take it. You never blame your team. Never. If there were circumstances that made the failure inevitable, sure, you should clearly state that. You never have 100% control over the outcomes. It's, 
almost impossible. Your partners will fall behind schedule. Competitors release products that steal your thunder when you're trying to launch. Market conditions can completely change consumer behavior. Just do your best to understand why the failure occurred. Explain the factors that impacted the outcome. And most importantly, and this is what every manager wants to see from you, document what you learned from it. That's going to increase your chances of your chances of success next year. I mean, failure is inevitable. What separates the best from the rest is that they are not destroyed by failure. The most successful people learn and evolve and grow and learn from that failure. Number five is your project. So document every project you worked on during the year. Some of these will be projects that were planned and they were tied to your goals and your commitments. But as I've discovered, many will be unexpected projects that got dumped on your plate later. Even if it's only a small contribution that you made to help out a coworker, document it. All of those little efforts add up. I know some people who were incredibly great team players. They were always helping their coworkers. But sadly, they were never recognized for it. Their formal list of projects was kind of mediocre, but the value they added to the organization was tremendous. Unfortunately, it wasn't recognized. And I can think of a few individuals that didn't get promoted, even though they were doing amazing things for the team as a whole. Don't let this happen to you. Document everything you worked on so your manager understands how much you are contributing overall. Now, great leaders, they'll notice what you did. They'll notice your involvement. But again, most bosses aren't great leaders and they're just busy and they, they're going to have to be reminded by you. This is also a great time to keep adding to your portfolio. And portfolios are not just for designers. Everyone can benefit from documenting project-based work and accomplishments. I have worked with so many clients who struggled to build their portfolio long after projects were completed, sometimes even after they had left the company. And it's really hard to get the data and information you need later, much harder. So create a simple one pager per project that explains what the project was, the role you played, the problem statement, the goal, the desired outcomes, the work that was done what actually launched, what the results were, lessons learned, things like that. You should also probably document trade-offs that had to be made. So that can explain why a project didn't turn out as you had hoped and what you're going to do differently next time. Six is additional responsibilities. It's all too easy to forget all those little side projects and those tasks that come up during the year. So you may be looking at your list of formal projects and you're thinking, is that all I did? <laughs> I, I seemed a lot busier. And the reality was you were busy, but you probably took on additional work without even thinking of keeping track of it. So go back through your calendar, your email, your messages, your projects. There's probably a lot of work that you've done that doesn't neatly fit into a project definition. And it's much easier to capture this long list of tiny little things weekly or maybe even daily. And that's something for you to think about for next year. Instead of trying to play catch up, keep a running list of all the small tasks, activities, and contributions you're making. Seven are your success metrics. So this is related to your project work, but this is focused more on what actually launched. So documenting these metrics is not just helpful for your performance review or making a case for your promotion. It's also critical for constructing a much more powerful resume and LinkedIn profile. Potential hiring managers and recruiters, they want to see examples of what you accomplished in your past jobs. If you just have fuzzy statements that speak to your activities and role, like I created spreadsheets, that's not very useful. 
much more powerful to have examples like, hey, that project that I delivered increased sales by 23%, or it drove an additional 5 million in revenue for the quarter. I was a designer for probably, I'm thinking almost nine years before I even touched metrics. And that happened when I went to eBay. I mean, part of it was I worked on stuff that was before the rise of the web. So it was not as easy (laughs) to track metrics and see what people were doing. But eBay was a very data-driven company. However, I still meet designers who don't know what needle they're trying to move with their design work. And that is a career-limiting mistake. When I moved into leadership and product, a big part of me being able to do that was I understood how design drives product and business success. I know the data. And there are ways to learn this. There's tons of free courses and paid courses. I link those in the newsletter. So if you go to newsletter.invinciblecareer.com and check out uh, this checklist article, I've linked a lot of this information. Number eight is requesting feedback. So be proactive in identifying coworkers who you want to provide feedback on your performance for the year. And it's going to be tempting to only ask people that you know are going to give you a great review (laughs) and say positive things. But first, that's not how you learn and grow. And second, your manager is going to ask people for feedback that worked with you anyway, whether you enjoyed working with them or not. As with the failures task, get ahead of the feedback. Reach out to people you worked with, schedule a quick meeting just to ask for their input on how things went. Now, some people are going to be comfortable with that. Some will not. And that's okay. Meet with those who are willing. Let the other people know they could just send you a quick email with some notes. But just the very act of asking for the feedback and input is a sign of professionalism. People notice it. They'll appreciate it. Number nine is testimonials. So this one's going to feel a bit strange to those of you who have always been employees. But if you've been a consultant or a solopreneur or a business owner, you're pretty familiar with asking clients and customers for testimonials. And we do that because the opinion of a third party carries more weight than your own personal assessment of your performance. Your manager is going to assume that you have some bias, of course. So you're going to ask coworkers for feedback. Some of it's going to contain constructive criticism. There may even be some negative feedback, some complaints. However, there's probably a few who say really great things about you. So don't be shy about asking them for a few positive testimonials. Ideally, you would do this throughout the year and kind of build up a list. So think about doing that next year, kind of on a rolling basis. But it's okay to ask for it now. It's, it's still useful. Number 10 is team contribution. It's one of the factors that managers look at when they're considering somebody for a promotion. It's a sign that someone's going above and beyond and adding value to the organization that is beyond their primary work performance. Because when people do this, they help everyone get better at what they do. It elevates the entire organization. You know, some examples could be maybe you share useful research and articles with your team. Maybe you acquired a new skill and you taught other people how to do that. Maybe you learned something at a conference or a workshop and you brought it back and shared that knowledge with your coworkers. So document all the times that you helped other people get better at their craft. You mentored people. You helped onboard a new employee. Go back and make a list of all that. Number 11 is industry involvement. When I used to discuss potential promotions with the other corporate leaders, and we always did, we talked about something we called expanding spheres of influence (laughs) for high potential employees. If people consistently had influence at a level above their current role, it was a sign that they might be ready to move up. You know, when you're just starting out, your influence is probably just with the coworkers that you collaborate with on projects. And over time, that sphere of influence is going to expand. It's going to include people in your immediate department. 
but later you'll start having influence within the broader organization. And after that, you start getting noticed and you have an impact across maybe the entire company. And eventually, the most senior people might become known at the industry level. We all probably know a few people in our profession who are known by almost everybody in the industry. You mention their name and then someone says, oh yeah, I attended one of their talks or I was at their workshop. Oh, I read their articles. I read their blog post. Or I've watched their videos when they present at conferences. So document all the times that you demonstrated your expanding sphere of influence. How were you involved with other members of your profession beyond the company? What did you contribute to the broader industry? And I've linked some ways to do this, and it can be writing articles, giving talks, participating on a panel, being interviewed on a podcast, you name it. Number 12 is professional growth. So what new skills and knowledge did you acquire this year? How did you invest in your professional growth? And that could include these conferences, talks, workshops, you know, attending them. And the wonderful thing about this type of investment is that it's good for the company and it's great for you. Everything you've done to grow professionally will make you more effective in your job. It'll position you better for promotion and it will make you more desirable in the job market. For example, one area of professional growth that you always hear me talk about is becoming comfortable with public speaking. That would be a great investment if you're not already doing that. As you look forward to the coming year in 2022, think about where you would like to continue investing in your professional development. And look for opportunities for your employer to either provide that training, so maybe it's available within the company, or have them fund it. See if you can get them to pay for it or reimburse you for training outside of the company. Companies usually have a budget for this but you'll have to ask. Number 13 are new priorities. So it's time to kind of look forward. This is your opportunity to demonstrate that you understand what's important to your manager. And it should also show that you know what's important to the company. What do you believe are the company's new priorities in the coming year? What will your organization focus on? How does all that translate into your new priorities? A performance review is, it's a look back. It's a look back at the the prior year. And you're trying to, you're trying to show that you're performing well, maybe even above your level. But if you want to make the case for a promotion or a big raise, you have to look a bit forward. More junior employees tend to focus on priorities that personally affect them. They just think about their own world. And so they'll say things like, one of my priorities for the coming year is to be a lead on a bigger project. It's kind of all about them. However, senior employees and the ones who are operating at the next level, the folks who are ready for promotion, they tend to see the big picture of what the organization needs and what the company thinks is critical. They're going to say things like, in the coming year, my priority will be to successfully launch a project that will add $12 in recurring revenue for the company. So it's going to be good for them too, but they're demonstrating that they are thinking about the company, the benefit for the company. 14 are going to be your new goals. So given these new priorities, what goals do you want to commit to for the coming year? What do you plan to accomplish? You've probably learned a lot about making commitments and creating stretch goals and probably found out maybe the hard way, the likelihood of achieving them. So now you should be getting better at identifying goals that have a higher likelihood of meeting and exceeding those goals. As with the priorities, these goals should reflect that you're thinking and operating at the next level. You want to commit to goals that are meaningful for the company and your manager, and you want to make sure this is something you personally are able to commit to, and you know it can be measured. I made some mistakes with this early in my career. I chose goals that weren't entirely under my control. And so that meant I could fail to reach those goals no matter how hard I worked. 
I sometimes made mistakes with choosing goals that weren't easy to tie to a quantitative measurement. And again, that wasn't good for me. <laughs> that, that left the success or failure determination kind of open to interpretation by my manager. It was qualitative. So you want to commit to goals that are meaningful, ambitious, but you know you have a high degree of control over achieving them. And you know there will be no uncertainty about your success. 15 are going to be your personal goals and plan. So this specific task may be something you don't want to share with your manager, but you should do it for yourself. What do you personally want to achieve in the coming year? For example, your personal goal could be to get promoted to the next level, but maybe you know that's impossible in your current company. There's no room for you to move up with your current employer. So your personal plan might be find a new job that's going to give you the growth opportunity you need. I often will ask my clients, my career coaching clients and my leadership coaching clients to create a 10-year goal, a five-year goal, and something a little more focused that's just for the next year. And you're going to learn that these longer-term goals like the five and 10 year ones, they're going to evolve. They're going to change, but that's to be expected. However, knowing where you ultimately want to land with your career in life will help you make tough decisions in the coming year. Cause you may be faced with a few options that all seem reasonable, but when you think about where you want to be in 10 years, one of those paths will emerge as being more aligned with your objective. Having a goal without a plan is just daydreaming. It's fun to think about, but it's not likely to magically (laughs) come true on its own. So you want to map out what you need to do over the coming months to achieve your goal for the year. Create a plan for making progress toward your longer-term goals. And identify weekly activities and daily habits that you need to stay focused and stay on track. So finally, number 16, I want to talk a little bit about the business of you. So I've talked about an elevator pitch and how important that is. And that is essentially explaining who you are, what you do, and who you help, how you help them. I've referred to this being a pitch that describes the business of you. It's basically your professional value proposition. What value do you add to the company? What value do you add for your employer? Why should a new employer hire you? If you're an entrepreneur, you're a solopreneur and you have your own business, why should a customer purchase your products or your services? The statement doesn't need to be a super long essay. Try to boil it down to one to three sentences at the most. You know, for example, Let's say someone is a photographer and that's their business. They could have an elevator pitch that is, I ensure that young couples never forget their wedding day by creating a stunning visual keepsake of their most magical moments. That's like a one sentence elevator pitch that explains what they do, who they help and how they do it. So uh, doing these tasks, getting through this checklist is going to make your life a lot easier next year when you're thinking about how do you want to get promoted or if you want to get a big raise, you're going to look for a new job. I find it easier to do this kind of on a regular basis. So I used to use a Word document. Now I've switched to Evernote. You can use whatever's good for you. If it's a Google Doc or something else on your phone, you know, try to track all this information weekly instead of trying to play catch up at the end of the year. Um, Your company, most companies are probably going to kick off their performance reviews in the beginning of the year. The budgets get allocated, decisions are made about raises and promotions, and you want to be ready to take advantage of the opportunity. If you have your goals, plans, and data prepared, you'll be better positioned to make a case for what you want out of the coming year. And that might be a promotion. It might be a raise. Maybe you want to ask for a training. You want to attend a conference. Whatever it might be, This is going to help set you up for success. So just a quick tip before I 
wrap this up. If you have a copy of your performance review from last year, you can use this as a starting point for writing your review this year. If you're new to a company though, or you don't have a copy of last year's review, see if you can get a copy of the review template from your manager. It's going to show you what's important to track and the things you want to call out. Um, sometimes there's a levels and expectations document that also is really helpful. So if you're looking at a promotion, you can take a look at the level above you and see what the performance expectations are. And then focus your self-review to highlight examples of how you're already hitting those expectations for that level. And that's how you make the case for a promotion. Best of luck with writing this up. Reach out to me if you have any questions. Uh, go to newsletter.invinciblecareer.com. Look for this article. This is Finish This Checklist Before the End of the Year, Issue 335. Might be a little bit easier to read and use some of the information in a text-based format. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you would like to follow upcoming releases of the show, please subscribe. And as always, I appreciate your ratings and reviews. Thank you. If you would like to learn more about Invincible Career and the podcast, you can visit InvincibleCareer.com. Until next time, I wish you the best of luck in becoming an opportunity magnet for the best things in life.